Good evening, colleagues, um, and welcome to tonight's webinar from a very warm evening uh, in Johannesburg. Um, today's topic, as I'm sure you know, since you've registered or well away, is an introduction to squamous cell carcinoma, um, which I personally find very interesting, and I'm sure you'll do the same following Professor Wood's talk. If I hand over to our speaker and give a brief introduction, um, I'd like to just um, mention the house rules. Uh, please refrain from using the raised hand, but rather type your comments uh, in the Q&A tab, please. The event for tonight qualifies for one CPD point. Uh, the certificates, the CPD certificates will be loaded to the side of the platform, and you'll then be able to access these under your member profiles. If you're not a SADA member, you'll be able to create a profile for yourself and thereafter um, access your CPD certificates. We are uh, streaming live on YouTube as well, if you are having trouble uh, accessing this. So Professor Wood uh, completed dentistry at the University of Pretoria, where he also obtained his postgraduate diploma in maxillofacial and oral pathology. After specializing in oral medicine and periodontics, his clinical and academic experience further developed at the University of Limpopo, Madunsa campus, and later as an associate professor and head of the clinical unit at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. The focus of his PhD, which was done at a combination of two universities, that of Antwerp in Belgium, and SMU was on the prevalence of human papillomavirus in the mouth and oropharynx. Professor Wood has authored and co-authored many national and international peer-reviewed papers and currently has several ongoing research projects and postgraduate students. He is a past president of the South African Society for Periodontology, Implantology and Oral Medicine and served a few organizations such as the International Association for Dental Research Ethics Institute of South Africa and the International Academy of Oral Oncology. He served on editorial boards of peer-reviewed dental journals and is the current managing editor for the South African Dental Journal. Professor Wood currently holds the position of full professor and head of the clinical unit at SNU and is the acting head of the part. Professor Wood, thank you for taking the time out in your busy schedule uh, to agree to do this webinar. I certainly am looking forward to it. Um, the platform is yours. Prof, we can't hear you. Thank you, Dr. Petras. I'm sure everything is online now. Great, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Really appreciate it. And uh, good evening to everybody and welcome to this webinar. And uh, I look forward to spending a little bit of time with you this evening when we look at oral cancer. I'm going to share my slides and we will jump straight in. Great. So we will be looking at an introduction to squamous cell carcinoma. And while doing that, um, I would like us to focus on a few points. We will discuss the epidemiology of oral cancer, clinical manifestations, metastases. We will touch on the, epi uh, the etiology. I will give some information on potentially malignant lesions, and we will look at screening and diagnosis as well as prognostication. And there will be a small conclusion with some cases that we will show. So oral cancer remains an important public health problem. It affects both men and women and all racial groups around the globe. The mean age of onset is at around 60 years, but younger patients are increasingly affected. Oral cancer has multiple forms of presentation and this sometimes makes the disease difficult to recognize, especially in its early stages. And, and that's really where we want to have our focus on. Our recent decades have seen tremendous advances in the understanding 
of the etiology, the biology and molecular basis of oral cancer, as well as important clinical advances when we look at screening and diagnosis and management of this disease. So let's start by looking at the epidemiology of oral cancer. Oral and oropharyngeal cancers grouped together are considered to be the sixth most common cancer that leads to cancer-related death. Global estimates indicate that oral cancer is one of the most common cancers in the world. In several countries, this cancer falls in the top 10 of all cancers. Depending on the paper that you read in the year of publication, you'll find incidence rates reported for oral squamous cell carcinoma ranging between 1% and 4% of all cancers in the Western world. And almost 40% in some places like India by comparison. Oral squamous cell carcinoma as an entity accounts for about 90% of all oral malignancies. The incidence of oral squamous cell carcinoma increases with age, with a majority of cases developing in people 50 years or older. In general, at the turn of the century, the average patient age for most of the published series on this disease was around 62 years of age, but a trend started with an increasing incidence in younger patients under the age of 40 years, uh, 45 years, which uh, is still continuing. The incidence of oral squamous cell carcinoma has been increasing in developing countries, and there is evidence suggesting a rise in incidence of oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in the tongue subsite in younger patients of developed countries. In developing countries, oral squamous cell carcinoma is predominantly a cancer affecting older males who smoke tobacco. However, in countries with effective public health strategies, smoking rates uh, are declining rapidly. So despite this, even in these nations, oral squamous cell carcinoma incidence is increasing. And it appears that this is a result of an increase in younger non-smoking females. Even so, the cause for this is not clear, although some speculate a pathogenic association with human papillomavirus infection, but we will touch on that a little bit later. Well, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is the sixth most prevalent cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. And up to one third of these malignancies do result from an infection, which, as I said, we will explore a bit later. In sub-Saharan Africa, substantial regional variations in the incidence and mortality rates of lip and oral cancer are reported. So these include, now if we look at per 100,000, 7.3 in Kenya, 6.8 for Tanzania, 6.5 for Botswana, and in South Africa, it's at 6.3. In the period between 1992 and 2001, the overall incidence rates of oral and oropharyngeal cancer remained more or less stable in South Africa, but there had been notable increases among colored South Africans during that time. The HIV pandemic has not had a spiking effect on oral squamous cell carcinoma in Africa, from what we can see in the literature. The study was done by uh, Professor Ayo Yusuf et al. in uh, 2013 and was really the best that we have at this point in time with reflected um, data concerning oral and pharyngeal cancer uh, in our country. And what it shows us is that males have a really large proportion of these lesions when compared to females, uh, substantially more. It is time for this to be updated. It's almost 10 years. So we will be getting into this soon. The literature clearly shows us that oral cancer is linked to socioeconomic status and also to deprivation, with the highest incidence rates occurring in the most disadvantaged groups of people. Throughout the literature, there's evidence, and it's consistent, whether it's measured by income, education, or employment status. A small word on initiation and progression, but also we want to avoid getting into technicalities, um, but oral cancer can develop de novo or spontaneously, or from pre-existing fields of cancerization, appearing as a non-sinister lesion to more overt appearances. And the first step in carcinogenesis is DNA mutation or changes. A fundamentally common feature in oral carcinogenesis is the gradual accumulation of molecular defects and all these changes collectively initiate phenotypic, that is clinical and microscopic transformation from the normal epithelium to dysplastic 
and finally to full-on invasive carcinoma. So until clinically noticeable changes and transformation occurs, the lesion will remain clinically undetectable and the growth and progression has to advance considerably through these phases until it is actually clinically detectable and becomes a carcinoma. Let's look at some of the clinical manifestations. All squamous cell carcinomas initially manifest as localized and usually well delimited erythrolycoplachic areas. Apart from the red or combined white red color, the only salient feature of these lesions is their hardened texture, resulting from partial loss of mucosal elasticity. The early lesions of oral squamous cell carcinoma are usually non ulcerated, though over time, one or more ulcerated zones do appear. And these are usually characterized by somewhat irregular margins, a gradual increase in depth with elevated margins and increasing loss of elasticity. So by the time the lesions suffer ulceration, evident hardening is noted in response to any clinical exploration. Several months, in fact, can pass between the development of the plot and the appearance of the ulceration. In the pre-ulceration phase, the lesions are usually painless and nonspecific discomfort may be reported by the patient. Persistent and radiating pain develops once the ulceration is seen. And as the, the surface of the ulceration increases, the pain intensive, intensifies. And if there's perineural involvement, it'll worsen it as well. The presence of rolled margins and induration are the most significant features of malignancy. The lesions become increasingly larger over time and in a few months grow from less than two centimeters in size to the limit of what is regarded as early stage oral squamous cell carcinoma. That is a T2 tumor measuring under four centimeters in size. So the clinical progression of this lesion will be from a plaque or erythroplaquic like lesion, sometimes erosive with irregular margins that tend to be well-defined to ulcerated lesions with lateral progression and also in duration. Ulcerations can be irregular with extensive deepening and indurated and very firm surrounding tissue and borders. Eventually it could be fungating or rolled margins with ulcerated um, areas, very irregular with distortion or even destruction of tissues and anatomical borders. Let's look at metastases now. When considering neck metastases, the Committee for Head and Neck Surgery and Oncology of the American Academy for Otolaryngology classified the neck into six anatomical levels with eight groups of lymph nodes. It is known that tumors of the base of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the mandibular gingival tissue have a greater tendency to produce regional lymphatic metastases than tumors of the palate or maxillary gingiva. The lymph of the maxillary gingiva drains towards the lymph nodes of the submandibular region. The length of the hard palatal region drains directly towards the deep cervical lymph nodes through the parapharyngeal or retropharyngeal lymphatic system. In principle, most cancers of the floor of the mouth and mandibular gingiva are more likely to metastasize to cervical lymph node levels one to three. Tumor locations in oral posterior sectors have greater possibility of metastatic spread, and tumors on the mandibular gingiva are more likely to metastasize than tumors located in the maxillary region. Some regard the size of the tumor and other histopathological characteristics can significantly influence the risk of neck metastases for oral squamous cell carcinoma. The risk of regional lymph node metastases in head and neck cancer is directly conditioned by the location of the primary tumor, its size, as well as its depth, and of course, other histopathologic features. Each tumor is quite unique. Oral squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and mandibular gingiva has a strong tendency to produce neck metastases, and the metastatic risk is higher than might be expected, and elective neck dissection surgery is recommended for many cases. Major risk factors for oral cancer are well established in the published literature. We cannot go into all of these as it's quite extensive, but some of the more important ones are tobacco use, alcohol use, and betel quid chewing. 
The supporting evidence is mainly derived from cohort and case control studies that have been extensively evaluated by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC. And there's also new evidence from pooled analysis reported by the International Head and Neck Cancer Epidemiology Consortium that included studies from the US, Europe, and South America. So we will look at the points listed on this slide here for the purposes of this webinar. And the first one of these will be smoking. Now the relationship between the development of oral cancer and cigarette smoking, especially when combined with alcohol use is well established in the literature. A large number of studies have demonstrated the relationship between older male smokers and an established diagnosis of oral cancer. Tobacco smoking produces a number of known carcinogens and the potential role of tobacco smoke carcinogens in smoking associated cancers can be evaluated by various means but it is important to consider levels of the compounds in cigarette smoke and the ability to induce tumors in laboratory animals. Now each puff of each cigarette contains a mixture of thousands of compounds. And this includes more than 60 well-established and well-documented carcinogens. These carcinogens in the cigarette smoke belong to multiple chemical classes and include things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, N-nitrous amines, aromatic amines, aldehydes, volatile organic hydrocarbons and also metals. In addition to these well-established carcinogens, others have been less thoroughly investigated. And these include alkylated PAHs, oxidants, free radicals, ethylating agents, and so on. Now, considerable evidence indicates that in human cancers caused by cigarette smoking, some of these uh, carcinogens that I just mentioned play a major, major role. Alcohol consumption has a strong connection with several cancer types in the literature. But the synergistic effects of alcohol consumption and tobacco smoke increases the risk of oral cancer, making the oral epithelium more permeable, dissolving the constituents of the tobacco product, and promoting its penetration into the epithelium. However, looking at alcohol use in itself, the chronic use thereof, may lead to oral cancer through several mechanisms, such as DNA adduct formation, the generation of ethanol-related oxygen reactive metabolites, and interference with the DNA repair mechanisms. Um, and this is obviously not as frequent. Vaping. Well, this is a, a new trend. Not so new, but new. Uh, there was a paper published uh, last year by Ebersol and colleagues, and it was interesting in which they update the existing chemistry and environmental aspects of e-cigarettes. And they also provided an overview of the somewhat limited data on the potential oral health effects that could occur across the lifetime of daily e-cigarette users. And their findings suggest that e-cigarettes not only have systemic health concerns, we've all read and heard about things like popcorn, lung, etc., but it can also negatively affect the oral cavity. The chemical vapors produced by vaping can alter or damage the epithelial cells and can lead to oral ulcerations uh, and even oral cancer, which was also mentioned by Sundar et al. in 2016 for those interested. And then biddy smoking. Now biddies or locally manufactured tobacco products are mainly smoked in South Asia. And these are composed of coarse and uncured tobacco wrapped in tendu or tamburini leaf. And these are often smoked without filters. Now, BD smoking was specifically mentioned in the IARC monograph summary report as carcinogenic as early as 2004 for the oral cavity specifically. Almost all the studies reviewed on this topic showed a dose response relation for duration and frequency of BD smoking with a risk of oral cavity cancer. We're all familiar with shisha smoking or hookah. And this is commonly available in restaurants, cafes, and other eateries and places. It contains a high concentration of nicotine, tar, and carbon monoxide. So in water pipe smoking, the smoke passes through the water, and there is a general idea that it is less harmful than cigarette smoking. However, in a recent review, a strong association between water pipe smoking and head and neck cancer was reported. A study from Syria and Lebanon also associated water pipe smoking with P53 gene mutations in oral cancer. So this is also a uh, etiologic factor. Involuntary smoking, um, several studies have been done on involuntary smoking and it does show that it does increase the statistical risk for lung cancer. 
but the association with oral cancer is not established at all. Studies that investigated the potential association between involuntary smoking and oral cavity cancer do exist, but their findings are not convincing at all and no significant associations can be found in these. Shama consumption or betel quid consumption. Shama is similar to betel quid in which erica nut is used, but shama is a combination of powdered smokeless tobacco with ingredients like lime, pepper, ash, and flavoring agents. And this is placed in the buccal vestibule until the taste penetrates. Studies originating from the regions where shama or betel nut, uh, all these things are used, is more commonly used, have reported strong associations between daily usage and the formation of leukoplakia. The chewing of cut. Cut is a plant that is mostly used for chewing and is a mixture of catine and nor ephedrine. Now, some studies have reported a strong relationship between cat chewing and the development of oral cancer. One study from Kenya showed that chronic cat chewing could lead to abnormal epithelial thickening of the oral mucosa and an increased keratinization fibrosis, which is reminiscent of oral submucous fibrosis as well. We would have to touch on human papilloma virus, specifically HPV 16 for which carcinogenicity is established for oral and oropharyngeal and laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma in many studies. And it's considered a requisite etiologic factor for a molecular and clinically distinct subset of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Proportionally, oral and oropharyngeal cancers that originate from high-risk HPV infection may be small, but HPV-16 is responsible for the vast majority of these squamous cell carcinomas. Data from the US clearly shows that HPV-driven head and neck cancer has overtaken cervical squamous cell carcinoma there. Now, data on HPV-driven oral and oropharyngeal cancer from Africa is limited when compared to contributions from other uh, geographic regions in the West. And it's usually presented as small case series or series. A systematic review, for example, in 2013 on the prevalence of HPV um, infection globally uh, reported no data from Africa. Uh, their conclusion was that uh, research on HPV infection in these lesions are needed from Africa. Uh, two other, I uh, can quote two other uh, meta-analyses that also similarly did not include any data from Southern Africa. So the human papillomavirus and related diseases report that was published cited only two papers from South Africa regarding HPV associated head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. But this further highlights the data lag that we see from South Africa. The prevalence rate of HPV in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma ranges from 35.9% to 47% for the US, 28% for Europe and Asia, and it has overtaken cervical cancer as the most common HPV-induced cancer in the US, as I said. South African studies, on the other hand, report an extremely wide HPV detection spectrum of between 1.4% and 94.1%. Um, but there are very good reasons for this, and we are not going to go into that at this time in the webinar, and you're welcome to contact me for a discussion on that. Evidence for a similar causal relationship for HPV in the etiopathogenesis of oral squamous cell carcinoma is much less convincing. So whether or not the oral presence of oncogenic HPV types is incidental or a passenger infection, or whether it's transformative, this needs to be more clearly defined and, and studied. But the current evidence and data from what we can see supports the notion that high-risk HPV detection in the mouth is incidental as opposed to high-risk HPV infection of the oropharynx, where it plays a direct role in the etiopathogenesis of cancer of the oropharynx. Now, there are a number of potentially malignant disorders that actually have a risk of transforming into squamous cell carcinoma. Leukoplakia is the one that we all studied uh, as undergraduates, and we were all forced to study the definition and the current one where the World Health Organization describes a clinical diagnosis that includes any white lesion plaque or patch on the oral mucosa that cannot be considered clinically or pathologically as any other disease and early detection of leukoplakia is important because we can stop any possible transformation into aggressive squamous cell carcinoma, which would be much harder to treat. There's also this condition, proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. 
And this is a destructive form of oral leukoplakia that clinically presents as multiple slowly spreading white lesions with high reappearance rate and a high probability of malignant transformation. Multiple published case series on proliferative verrucous leukoplakia indicate a high rate of malignant transformation. And in this case, the gingiva and the palate are the most commonly affected sites. Urethroleukoplakia is also referred to as speckled leukoplakia by some, and it's a mixed red and white lesion that most likely exhibits more advanced dysplastic changes in histopathological examination when compared to leukoplakia. Now, these lesions usually have irregular margins and oftentimes are superinfected with uh, candida. The reported malignant transformation rate is at around 18 to 47%, depending on what you read. And one retrospective study showed that 91% of 58 cases that were clinically diagnosed as erythroplakia underwent final diagnosis as oral cancer of 51% and carcinoma in situ and severe dysplasia of 40%. Only 9% of those actually had mild or moderate epithelial dysplasia, which shows that yeah, there is indeed a problem. Erythroplakia is defined as any red lesion of the oral mucosa that cannot be clinically diagnosed as any other condition. And this tends to be a more alarming finding clinically compared to leukoplakia. Erythroplakia and leukoplakia are usually predecessors of oral cancer and sometimes also seen adjacent to an oral cancer lesion. Oral submucous fibrosis occurs due to progressive fibrosis of the oral mucosa resulting from chronic use, for example, of ericanut or similar carcinogens. Now, these patients are reportedly likely to develop oral cancer. And one prospective study that followed 371 oral cancer patients reported that 30% of these oral cancer patients had a history of oral submucous fibrosis. This slide shows you the pale and the, and the firm submucous tissue in this patient with oral submucous fibrosis. Another potentially malignant disorder is actinic keratosis or actinic chylitis. And these lesions are established as direct precursors of squamous cell carcinoma, but there's significant controversy regarding the rate at which these lesions progress to squamous cell carcinoma. Now, actinic keratoses usually affect older adults, and reducing sun exposure can help reduce risk. As the name implies, actinic is a etiology uh, concerning the sun. And is most common on the face, the lips, also found on the ears, back of the hands, forearm, scalp, and neck. But the rough, scaly skin patch enlarges slowly and usually causes no other signs or symptoms. A lesion may take years to develop. Palatal lesions associated with reverse smoking. Now, this disorder is specific to populations who smoke with the lighted end of the cigar or cigarettes inside the mouth, producing changes in the palatal mucosa. The largest number of reverse smokers are found in certain areas of India, but this habit is also practiced in some Latin American countries, in Sardinia and in the Philippines. The palatal changes consist of several components such as elevated white patches, red areas, ulcerations, and hyper or non-pigmented areas. Palatal mucosal changes in reverse smokers are of varying degrees, ranging from adaptive changes to potentially malignant lesions and ulcerations. The adaptive changes include, among others, hyperpigmentation and excrescence. Depigmented areas are the transition regions between the adaptive and the potentially malignant lesions. And as can be seen, it can be quite clearly defined, even though it may be quite irregular. And then also can develop ulcerated or erosive areas. Oral lichen planus, a bit of a controversy, is an immune mediated condition that clinically presents as reticular white areas that may or may not be associated with erosive and ulcerative lesions, depending on the type. Clinically, oral lichen planus can present as white striations, white papules, white plaques, erythema, erosions, or even uh, vesiculation or bullet. 
So they usually present as symmetrical and bilateral or multiple lesions. The buccal mucosa, the dorsum of the tongue, and the gingiva are commonly affected. And based on its clinical appearance, it's classified into six types. So reticular or annular, then we have papular, plaque-like, erosive, atrophic, and bullous. The two major clinical forms are reticular and erosive types. There is an ongoing debate whether to consider this condition as potentially malignant, but what seems to be clear from the literature is that the erosive type of oral lichen planus in patients with a history of smoking and alcohol use will more likely suffer from transformation to oral cancer than any of the other forms. We will now touch on screening and diagnosis, but just to pause here for a thought, um, the early detection of cancer is, is a key factor for improved prognosis and increased patient survival rate. Oral cancer has a very high recurrence rate, and patients who survive a first encounter with this disease have up to a 20-fold increased risk of developing a second cancer. Thus, early identification of recurrence or of a second primary tumor remains an important challenge. So the implementation of an early detection scheme would have a positive impact on the prognosis of the disease. Even though the oral cavity can be easily examined and assessed by direct visual inspection that we do on a daily basis, most oral cancers are not identified early. And this could be for any number of reasons. The most commonly reported reason in the literature is simply that patients do not seek dental care on a regular basis, and most oral cancers in the early stages are asymptomatic. It also happens on occasion that dentists may not be aware of the different clinical presentations of oral cancer and could misdiagnose cancers as reactive or something else benign. So patient awareness and education as well as regular educational activities for your own staff need to be a part of daily practice. So many have published on the screening for cancer. Some techniques are better than others, but all are in agreement that prevention is better than cure. There are also a number of potentially malignant disorders in the mouth that have the predisposition to transform into cancer, and we looked at some of these now. So looking at so screening and diagnosis, exfoliative cytology is a simple method that could in theory be useful in early cancer detection. By aggressively rolling that brush, which is a Rovers or Selex brush, uh, which is used with liquid-based cytology for those who are, inter who are interested, but in any case, we collect uh, cells that exfoliate from the area where you apply this brush and you apply it until you obtain bleeding, which means that you get quite deep. It's rather uncomfortable, but it has its drawbacks. And one of these is that the oral epithelial cells do exfoliate naturally. Other benign or malignant conditions can also be present and you, know, you can have some camouflage or masking of conditions. There are a large number of papers published that talk to the advantages and disadvantages of this oral cytologic investigations. But in general, the view is that the biopsy should remain the standard for diagnosis, and this will serve as a guide only. So talking about biopsy, there are many exciting new technologies in development for the early detection of oral cancer, many of which rely on molecular markers, and I'll touch on them just now. But until this technology becomes more refined, becomes cheaper, becomes more widely available, the biopsy remains the gold standard. An adequate biopsy technique requires that tissue of sufficient depth and width be excised and that the specimen be handled correctly. Tissue specimens are usually placed in formalin immediately after excision and embedded in paraffin wax in the oral pathology laboratory for subsequent processing and all the investigations and stainings that they will do there. There's something called vital staining, which involves using a dye such as toluidine blue or telonium chloride to stain and highlight abnormal tissue regions. Abnormal cells uh, are stained more easily than normal cells. Studies on this report a high sensitivity for the screening tool. However, even if positive staining is obtained, a biopsy is, of course, still indicated. Chemiluminescence is a technique that involves the emission of visible light following a chemical reaction. It has been devised to detect oral cancer at the early stages where we need it. The patient's mouth is rinsed with 1% acetic acid solution to enhance light penetration. 
to remove debris and to disrupt the glycoprotein barrier. Chemiluminescent products usually contain hydrogen peroxide and acetyl salicylic acid, which react and emit a diffuse bluish white light with wavelength between 430 and 580 nanometers for a short while. So abnormal epithelium would appear pale or whitish, whereas normal epithelium will appear darker. The major limitation of this technique is that studies show it has difficulty in differentiating between benign inflammatory, and potentially malignant and malignant lesions of the oral mucosa. Some studies have shown the technique to be ineffective to detect dysplasia or malignant cells. So at this point in time, we can't rely on it. Native uh, fluorophores in the oral epithelium and submucosa can be excited upon exposure to light within the UV visible range, which causes the tissue to fluoresce. A carcinogenesis induces modifications in the concentration and fluorescence properties of these fluorophores in the cells. Autofluorescence imaging and spectroscopy have been used to analyze tissue autofluorescence, and the Valscope, the little device on the right, is one such commercially available device that we use to screen for oral cancer or precancer, and it's based on the structural and metabolic changes of the epithelium and also of the connective tissue upon light penetration. So normal mucosa will appear pale green, but any dysplastic or malignant lesions with these types of metabolic alterations appear relatively darker due to reduced autofluorescence. Biomarkers. The choice of your cellular tissue or body fluid that you are going to use for the early detection of any cancer is in, uh, clearly dictated by the, the breadth of the assay that you need to apply. A biomarker that can detect one cancer and rule out any others will necessarily require a systemic body fluid, for example, plasma, serum, saliva, urine. Alternatively, if a biomarker is to have a high sensitivity for a single cancer, uh, say such as breast cancer, then breast aspirate fluid or ductal lavage fluid may be a better for a specific matrix in which one would be less likely to find a false positive. Um, similarly, for bladder cancer, biomarker may reach a higher specificity if measured in urine rather than in blood. So whether testing these matrices for early detection, diagnosis, or recurrence of cancer, a variety of types of analytes and technologies are available, such as proteins, nucleic acids, or metabolites. Now, human saliva could be used for the early detection of various diseases conditions. And it comes as no surprise that many ongoing research efforts are directed towards genomics, proteomics, and biomarkers in cancer. The tumor biomarkers are molecules often produced by the tumor itself or the host system in response to the tumor and provide the biological material to determine the risk of getting cancer, to detect cancer or to classify the cancer or to provide insight into the prognosis and therefore a therapeutic advantage. Tumor biomarkers include cancer-specific mutations or changes in gene expression or promoter methylation, which can result in alterations in protein expression. Now, this is unique to the cancer itself. Because cancer cells shed DNA and RNA in the circulation, this is a phenomenon rarely seen in healthy individuals. So the tumor-specific genetic changes uh, such as promoter methylation or gene mutations or circulating small RNAs are detectable in plasma or other body fluids. Cancer biomarkers are discovered and utilized with a specific purpose in mind, such as the early detection of cancer, diagnosis, prognosis, response to anti-cancer therapies, or even cancer recurrence. Cancer cells provide the biomarker material that can lead to their own detection which then provides the opportunity for their own non-invasive detection in body fluids and tissues, so as to reveal the presence of tumors to the level of, of the tumor burden. Biomarkers for cancer diagnosis, prognosis, and response to therapy have become possible through many studies of specific carcinogenic mechanisms that lead to the development of clinical tests to predict the optimal or targeted therapeutic approach for any given cancer. So in terms of early detection, to detect cancer at its earliest stages when it's most curable, there is a need for biomarkers to detect individuals harboring occult cancers. The expectation is that 
early detection tests will be pursued with particular targeted subsets of patients in mind who need more intensive diagnostic imaging after a positive test. One approach for accomplishing this objective is to detect molecular fingerprints of an organ in the process of developing a cancer, and then to define biomarkers suitable as targets for treatments prior to significant tumor burden. Effective biomarker identification actually depends on multiple levels of the study design. And all this must be optimized to ensure that this biomarker or the panel of biomarkers for this application and early detection is effective. And the success of biomarkers for this early detection that we need is measured by the fact that they should not only detect the disease, but once we start applying them and using them, the mortality should be reduced in that population for that particular form of cancer. Saliva has the advantages that it contains low background of normal material and inhibitory substances, as well as fewer complexes than blood, for example. So it is a very informative body fluid, and it contains an array of analytes, proteins, mRNA, DNA, and all of this can be used as biomarkers for translation and clinical applications. Saliva has many advantages as a clinical tool over serum and tissues, including the simplicity of collection, the sorting, the shipping. It's cost-effective. It's easily available for larger sample volumes. Uh, it can also be used for monitoring of diseases or conditions over time. So the non-invasive saliva collection techniques dramatically reduce anxiety and discomfort of the patients. Saliva is also easier to handle for diagnostic procedures because no special equipment is actually needed for saliva sample collection, and it does not clot. So it reduces your manipulation, which may be required for biochemical analysis. That's the saliva-based analysis is a non-invasive alternative to serum analysis, and it can be effective modality for diagnosis and prognostication of cancer, as well as for monitoring post-treatment therapeutic responses of these patients. Therefore, the development of salivary diagnostic tools is of paramount importance, especially in the identification of high-risk groups, patients with pre-malignant lesions, and also patients with previous history of cancer. So when we consider the rapidly developing field of saliva omics, which is a, an interesting term, uh, which was coined by Galwash, in the contemporary biological era, the omics suffix method is a new biomarker detection tool that emphasizes um, exploring a large number of molecules present in the saliva. If we read the literature on this topic, there are five main salivary diagnostic constituents that are recognized. And these are the transcriptomics, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and microbiomics. We'll briefly touch on each of these points. The genomic content in saliva includes human and microbial DNA. So both the quality and the quantity of the salivary DNA are quite satisfactory, and it is sufficient for sequencing assortments and for polymerase chain reaction assays, PCRs. And it indicates that the value of salivary DNA is anal an analogous to that of blood. Um, many studies have found that pre-malignant lesions with aneuploidy transform into malignancy more frequently than those lesions containing normal DNA irrespective of whether there's epithelial dysplasia graded into histopathological observations. DNA aneuploidy was found to increase the frequency of malignant transformation of all potentially malignant disorders and is recognized to be linked with advanced stages of cancer. And hereafter, it may help in forecasting the longevity of cancer. Mutations in P53 genes are present in more than 50% of all primary oral squamous cell carcinomas and are seen in the advancement of pre-invasive to invasive cases. Inactivation of P53 gene products is the most common genetic ulcer alteration in all cancers because P53 regulates DNA synthesis, stimulates DNA repair, and initiates pathways leading to apoptosis. So mutations of P53 have been identified in 71% of salivary samples from oral cancers patients and in 22% of those with pre-cancer. A direct relationship was also observed between overexpression of P53 and a poor prognosis of oral cancer in terms of survival. Other gene products, P16, 27, 63, and 73, um, mitochondrial DNA, or even cycling B1 gene amplification 
are also associated associated with bowel cancer and can be detected in the saliva. Salivary transcriptome researchers are concerned with the study of all RNA transcripts and mainly focus on messenger RNAs, which is mRNA, or microRNA, miRNA. And it helps to disclose the functional features of the genome along with molecular constituents of cells and tissues. Several mRNA and miRNA candidates have been identified in the literature, and they allow the detection of many diseases, including oral cancer. Salivary proteome contains more than 2,000 proteins and peptides that are all tangled in various biological functions in the oral cavity. The salivary proteomic analysis has distinct benefits over blood and is commonly used in the diagnosis of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Proangiogenic, pro-inflammatory cytokines are raised in saliva of oral precancer and cancer patients compared to controls, which suggest it's possible efficacy as an indicator of malignant transformation from oral precancer to cancer. Just to touch on one marker for purposes of explanation and not to get too technical today, salivary epidermal growth factor receptor displayed higher concentrations in oral cancer patients compared to controls with a more rise, a higher rise in further advanced cases and was related to patient survival, which demonstrates a direct association with cancer behavior and characteristics. Also, it's targeted by recently developing therapies aiming to reduce its disturbed activation in oral cancer. So this is a promising biomarker for identification, prognosis, and follow-up of patients with oral cancer. Metabolomics comprise the whole set of small molecular metabolites, for instance, lipids, amino acids, vitamins, carbohydrates, hormone, nucleic acids, and additional signaling molecules. So library metabolomics are vital in explaining the pathogenesis of diverse diseases and in discovering metabolic alterations uh, related to the disease onset or therapeutic interventions. Therefore, they are a valuable tool for timely detection of several diseases, including oral cancer. Salivary level of phenylalanine, valine, and lactic acid were, was reported to be the best forecasters for distinguishing oral cancer from a healthy control and also for distinguishing oral cancer from pre-malignant lesions such as leukoplasia. Uh, leukoplasia. The hard and soft tissues in the mouth are colonized by bacteria and are constantly bathed in saliva. So recent technologies have allowed unraveling the complex interrelations between the microbes and the human body. For example, it was revealed that Trevitella melaninogenica, Capnocytophago gingivalis, and Streptococcus mitis, these three can be utilized as diagnostic markers to discriminate oral cancer from normal subjects with an 80% sensitivity and an 82% specificity. There are numerous such examples, but it would be, uh, wouldn't be complete without, again, mentioning the, the viral component. The presence of human papillomavirus and Epstein-Barr virus was reported in salivary samples of the oral squamous cell carcinoma patients, indicating that analyses of these salivary biomarkers could be a useful diagnostic and prognostic indicator of the oral potentially malignant disorders and of cancer. While there may be some limitations of the salivary biomarkers in that some report inconsistency in the levels of the biomarkers and validation in other inflammatory disorders aren't really well done at this point in time. And several serum markers are also present uh, in whole saliva. So that may influence the diagnostic usefulness of some, bio, uh, some salivary biomarkers. Certain medications, for example, or systemic conditions, um, even something like radiation may disturb salivary gland function and therefore the composition and also the, the, the quantity, the quality and the quantity of saliva. Prognostication. Now, several studies suggest that younger patients with oral squamous cell carcinoma have a worse prognosis, but there's now enough, enough evidence to show that this is not necessarily true. There is also a limited number of studies that investigated whether older patients have worse disease-specific outcomes than younger patients. One such study was a retrospective analysis of 287 patients with oral squamous cell carcinoma. And elderly females with cancer of the mouth, uh, of the oral cavity, who did not use alcohol regularly, had significantly worse survival rates. The authors of that paper went so far as to consider that a distinct patient population with poorer pop, uh, survival. 
A large international collaborative study with multi-institutional co contributions show that age, gender, the tumor subsite, and smoking status are all important drivers of survival in oral squamous cell carcinoma. And of all these, gender was the most important predictor with young and middle-aged females having had the most favorable prognosis. Survival rates for lip cancers, the overall five-year survival rate is at around 85% for oral cancers, though the situation is very different. In many regions, there have been no marked improvements in the five-year survival rates for intraoral cancer, which remained at about 50% despite advances in surgery and radiation treatment. In most South Asian countries, the five-year survival rate is below 50% compared to around 66% for the USA in the same time. An international collaborative study reported a slight increase in five-year survival for the period uh, 2001 to 2011 compared to the preceding 10 years. And as, as the stage at diagnosis had not shown any improvement, the reasons for these observations therefore remained unexplained. And the likely factors are advances in imaging and therapeutic intervention, so not early detection. Comparatively, cancer registry data from India revealed a five-year survival rate lower than 35% compared to 32 to 50% for countries like China, Korea, Singapore, and Thailand. The TNM classification is basically used when we do staging and classifying our oral squamous cell carcinoma. And staging and grading of this lesion, these are established prerequisites for management. They influence the risk stratification, and they are the first steps towards a personalized treatment for this patient. So in the TNM system, the T refers to the size and extent of the main tumor. The main tumor is usually called the primary tumor. The N refers to the number of nearby lymph nodes that have cancer, and the M refers to whether the cancer has metastasized. And this means that the cancer has spread from a primary tumor to other parts of the body. When cancer is described by the TNM system, there will be numbers after each letter that give more details about the cancer. So let's have a look at this before we get to stage. The clinical stage is an estimate of the extent of the cancer based on the results of physical exams, imaging tests, endoscopies, or any other biopsies or whatever other special investigation you've done before treatment starts. Now, for some cancers, the results of other tests such as blood tests are also used in the clinical staging. So that's the clinical stage. But if surgery to remove the cancer is the first treatment, the pathological stage can be determined. And the pathological stage relies on the results of the exams and tests done before surgery, as well as what is learned about the cancer during surgery. Staging might also be done after the first treatment to help describe the response to treatment. The earliest stage, oral cavity or oropharyngeal cancer are called stage zero or carcinoma in situ. Stages then range from one through to four, and as a rule, the lower the number, the less the cancer has spread. A higher number, such as stage four, means cancer has spread more. And within a stage, an earlier letter means a lower stage. So although each person's cancer experience is unique, cancers with similar stages tend to have a similar outlook and are often treated in much the same way. So stage one, the tumor is two centimeters or smaller, and the depth of invasion is five millimeters or less, and the cancer has not spread to lymph nodes. In stage two, it's still two centimeters or small, and the depth of invasion is a little bit more between five and 10 millimeters, or this tumor may be larger than two centimeters, but not larger than four centimeters. The depth of the invasion still is 10 millimeters or less. The cancer has also not spread to lymph nodes or other parts of the body. In stage three, it becomes a little bit more tricky. The tumor is larger than four centimeters or it is any tumor with a depth of invasion greater than 10 millimeters. So the cancer has not metastasized. Or the tumor is any size, but not has, has not invaded nearby structures of the oral cavity. And there is cancer in a single lymph node on the same side as the primary tumor, and the cancer is three centimeters or smaller. And stage four, the tumor has invaded nearby structures of the mouth, such as the jaw, sinuses, or skin of the face. If the cancer has spread to a lymph node, 
it is to only one node on the same side as the primary tumor and a cancer is three centimeters or smaller. Cancer has not spread to other parts of the body. It could also be that the tumor may be small or it may have invaded nearby structures and cancer has spread to one or more lymph nodes, but none is larger than six centimeters. Also no metastases. In stage 4b, the tumor is any size and the cancer is found in the lymph node and is larger than six centimeters, but there's no uh, metastases. The tumor has invaded the muscles and bones that form any part of the mouth or the base of the skull, and it encases some internal arteries. In stage 4c, the cancer has metastasized. So let's look at some clinical pictures very briefly before we conclude. This case is a courtesy of a colleague. It's a 74 year old female and all the requisite permissions for these pictures have been obtained. This cancer started 11 years ago when the teeth were taken out in this patient. And this patient did not have any history of smoking or alcohol use. And we can see on the alveolar ridge to the patient's right that there is some irregular tissue. There are the measurements for you to see. And of course, a biopsy was taken, which came back as a squamous cell carcinoma. And the lesion was subsequently excised completely and healed. As far as I'm aware, no recurrence has been mentioned. This was a 48-year-old male patient. He complained of six months history of sores in the mouth, which he said was painless. And he was a 30-pack years smoker. And here you can see the fungating extensive, um, extensively destructive lesion, which when biopsied came back as squamous cell carcinoma and even had perineural invasion. In this case, we had a 73-year-old uh, female with a two-year history of a sore on the lip. This patient smoked for 34 years, about 15 to 20 per day, but stopped smoking 20 years ago. There's some history of sun exposure. She likes gardening, things like that. But this is a two-year history, 20 years after uh, smoking cessation. You can see the indurated and fungating lesions with the central depression. This is very firm and hard, and this patient had a lot of pain. Following treatment, this is the outcome for this patient. So in conclusion, seeing as my time is running out very fast, oral squamous cell carcinoma remains a major public health concern and problem. We need a lot more research and funding into early detection techniques and also prevention. And specifically advancements in the omics section that I've discussed, we'll see rapid advances in the coming years for early detection and saving many lives. Please feel free to contact me via email for any additional reading or, or any additional discussions and I'll be happy to engage with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wood, for this very insightful presentation. Um, I say I'm fascinated at the statistics of uh, oral cancer being the sixth most prevalent cancer in the world. And I think that highlights uh, the central role that we play as oral health practitioners uh, in screening each and every one of our patients, um, which can potentially save their lives. Uh, I'm gonna start with, we do have a couple of questions. Um, there are quite a few, I'm not, sure if we'll be able to take all of them, but let's start. Uh, the first one is, how many cases of oral submucous fibrosis have you seen for the time you have been in practice? Uh, personally, I've, I've only seen about three or four. I have not seen more or more have not gone through my hands. Um, that was an easy one to answer, yes. I don't know about you, Dr. Kutras. I've only seen one. Yeah. one. 
second question is the presence of HPV for life once there is exposure? Uh, if so, can oral cancer develop years after initial exposure? Yeah, that is a very interesting question. Um, in general, once you obtain HPV, it can go one of several routes, and it also depends on the type of HPV that you've acquired. There's more than 250 subtypes. So viral latency can occur um, in the high-risk types. Um, and if there are epigenetic changes, then generally you, should, uh, you could be concerned, but you wouldn't know. However, in the vast majority of oral HPV or pharyngeal HPV infection, there is viral clearance. So the vast majority of these are cleared and um, people do get reinfected. Um, some people have more than one uh, HPV subtype, although it's much more rare than having one subtype only. Um, it's a very small percentage in which viral persistence stays and transformation is induced. And that is when the virus is not um, in the cell as an episome, it actually integrates into the DNA induce, and hijack, hijacks the, the cellular machinery uh, with its E7, E6 proteins. And then it sort of becomes a little factory for making itself. It goes dormant for a while. It can stay latent. Um, and it has a number of uh, host immune evasion capacities and techniques as well. But in general, the vast majority, majority are cleared. Uh, third question, is there a link between dental radiographs, whether intra or extra oral, to oral cancer? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Is there a link between dental radiographs, whether intra or extra oral, to oral cancer? I don't know if that's got to do with detection on a radiograph. I'm not quite sure how you interpret that, Prof. Thank you. Yeah, I think my interpretation is more of an etiologic concern um, overexposing a patient to radiation mm -hmm. and it induced transformation. I don't think with modern um, intraoral radiographs, uh, I have not come across any studies that indicate a relationship between intraoral x-rays or radiographs and the development of all squamous cell carcinoma. I have not seen anything like that. Um, I'm not aware of any cases like that. Um, so I, I can't say no, because there's never a conclusive answer in, in medicine and dentistry, but I certainly am not aware that it could uh, induce all uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the next question, how prevalent is oral cancer in Dacha smokers that use a short stem pipe or bottle heads? The heat generated is similar to that in reverse smoking. It's an oddly specific question, but very interesting nonetheless. Um, I don't know. I think that if we look at the, the etiologic factors um, in the situations that we are aware of, for example, the reverse smoking or the normal cigarette smoking or even pipe smoking, uh, is there a filter? Is there not a filter? What are the additives being used? Then it becomes a bit of a, a tricky situation. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that use that specific setup, but I think that um, there are some studies that look at um, cannabinoids and cannabis use, but um, as far as the carcinogens are concerned, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with any of those. Um, there are patients that mix it with normal tobacco products, in which case then you find all these carcinogens in there as well. Um, the cannabinoids have their own chemical composition and effects, of course, but then, of course, you have the heat, which does play a role, as the person asking the question alludes to. And those heat-specific changes are then what would uh, be of concern. Are there HPV markers that are common to both oral and cervical cancer? If so, is this of any significance in people indulging in oral sexual practices? Yeah. Indeed, um, it is uh, the most commonly sexually transmitted infection, uh, human papillomavirus. And once again, it depends on the subtype. Are you getting a high risk uh, subtype of HPV 16 or 18 or 32, or is it going to be a generally um, low risk 
HPV type. So the low risk types are responsible for your, your warts, so your condylomas, uh, Veruca vulgaris, and those. Your high risk types lead to your epithelial dysplasia and eventually cancer. Not all, uh, very small percentage, but they are the ones responsible for it. And yes, you can fingerprint them. Um, there could be um, the same HPV present in the mouth and in the genital area of any particular patient. There are a number of studies uh, on that within even the South African setting that have looked at it. So if you're asking about markers specifically, there are a number of markers, but the easiest one to use is the polymerase chain reaction for the DNA of the virus itself. So it's, you need a very small sample and the PCR is done and it will come back positive, not only positive, but you can type it as well. It will tell you exactly which type you're dealing with, whether it's a high risk or a low risk, not to worry about. Have there been any recorded cases of oral squamous cell carcinoma in the younger population, teen to young adults? Yeah, there are recorded cases, um, but they are rarer. And um, the etiologies are a little bit conflated and a little bit more tricky. Um, I've never seen oral squamous cell carcinoma in a younger patient, but I've seen in young adults. Um, the cases that I've seen were smokers, were heavy alcohol users, and other complicated uh, situations, um, systemic diseases and conditions, which quite possibly creates a very uh, con uh, confused situation. And there should be a lot of complex interactions in that patient. Um, as I said, the incidence in age is decreasing from the 60s to 50s to sub 45, according to the literature. And there is a shift in the etiology from the smokers, which are sort of dissipating to other etiological causes. What advice should I give to my patient as far as nutrition is concerned as a way to prevent oral cancer? Is there a relationship between the gut microbiome and oral cancer? There, there are studies that looked at the, the gut microbiome and, and the risk of developing oral cancer. Um, I recall one looking at Helicobacter pylori, another one that they also linked to aphthous and you know, ulceration of the gastric lining. Um, in general, the advice that I would give is, uh, you know, your fruit and vegetables, fresh, not to boil away all the nutrients. Um, this is just one of the small things that you can do. There are, of course, a number of other things and that in and of itself is not sufficient. A healthy diet is imperative for all systemic health and not only just for the prevention of oral cancer. Um, one could advise a consultation with a dietitian that can actually give a lot more and better advice in that regard. But there are studies that do link a healthy lifestyle with fresh fruit and vegetables to uh, less or lower incidence of oral cancer development. Uh, of course, if you're going to look at um, fried foods or generally a more unhealthy lifestyle combined with those types of foods with alcohol use, that increases your risk to develop oral cancer. Uh, there's lots of compliments coming through, Prof. Thank you for an impressive presentation. Uh, and then just one last question. Uh, would you choose to treat proliferative verrucous leukoplakia as aggressively as an oral squamous cell carcinoma? For example, is segmental osteotomy indicated for your PVL? Yeah, look, uh, osteotomy, I don't think PVL involves bone. Um, but nonetheless, it does require aggressive treatment. There are reports of a very high rate of transformation to full-on squamous cell carcinoma. And this is one of the conditions that you don't take a chance with. So you would refer to your surgeon, preferably your maxillofacial or surgeon if it's a big lesion, for complete removal of it, or segmentally, depending on the situation and the circumstances, and also the anatomic location of the lesion. Um, of course, many other things need to be done from counseling through to behavioral modification and whatever else needs to be done. But I would um, advise uh, treating it as aggressively. Of course, they, they, it's, as it's not a full-on squamous cell carcinoma, there's no 
invasion, there's no metastases, and so your neck dissections and those things aren't necessary at that point in time. But whatever you excise, you will submit for histopathologic um, investigation. And depending on what the pathologist tells you, you would have the team discuss the way forward for that particular patient. Many of these are unique. Another compliment from Dr. Lochner. Thank you, Neil. Enjoyed the update. Um, there's also been um, a request if you're able to release your slides for further study and sharing with students. The students are welcome to contact me via my email and, and I will gladly oblige. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, colleagues, Prof, thank you again for your time. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and to all the colleagues that attended, thank you very much. We had a really great attendance tonight, over 220 uh, individuals. Uh, but before you go, just to remind you all to please uh, complete the evaluation after the webinar. And there is another upcoming webinar on the 18th of November, uh, the title of which the Sleep Disorder Spectrum uh, Mouth Breathing with Dr. Neil Langer. Another interesting topic coming up. Thanks again, everyone. Have a lovely evening and enjoy the rest of your